welcome everyone to the data science hangout. And of course, welcome back to all the familiar faces and anybody that's joining for the first time. Um, just to kind of let you know how these go. There's really no agenda at all. It's basically just a place for data science leaders and aspiring data science leaders to connect um, and ask questions to one another. So you can put questions in the chat um, or just jump in and ask live. We also have a Slido link for any uh, anonymous questions you wanna ask too. And Rob can help me by putting that in the chat window if you don't mind. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I'm joined by my co-host for today, Sandy Steiger, Director of Integrated Analytics, um, PET at the JM Smucker Company. And Sandy is passionate about community building and driving data and analytics usage across the organization. So really excited to talk to you today, Sandy. And we'd love to have you introduce yourself and maybe share a bit about your team and the work that you do. Absolutely. Uh, that was my first thing here. Uh, so my name is Sandy Steiger. I am the director of integrated analytics at Smucker. This is a new team actually that they're building. So I'm gonna, it's kind of helpful I think to get a history of why I landed where I'm at. So I'm gonna kind of talk through that a little bit for you. That'd be great. I, um, a lot of things in my life I feel like happened because I took a chance and someone suggested I do something and I was like, you know what, yeah, I'm going to try that. I think I'm going to try that. So I had a math and business degree when I was an undergrad and when I was graduating, I was like, you know what, I don't really know what I want to do. My personality is kind of big. What type of work can I do with math that's going like, to allow me to be me? And my professor was like, I think you should go on to learn more. And I said, I'll try that. So I went on to graduate school and I was going to go, I was going into um, applied mathematics and a friend of someone my mom was sitting next to at graduation, went to the same uh, graduate school I did, Miami University, and said she should do statistics. There aren't many females there. And I said, okay, I'm going to try that. And so I did. Uh, and I earned my master's in statistics in 2004. And then I went on to, uh, I was really fortunate because Dunhumby USA had just come to the US. Well, I guess they were Dunhumby, started their joint venture with Kroger. They came to the US and I met them and I was like, that fits my personality. They're analytics consultants. That's what I felt like they were, which I didn't want to be in a back room. I wanted to be out there meeting people, understanding their business problems, and then figuring out how can I use, well, at the time I was thinking statistics and to, to solve those problems. And frankly, I tell people now when I'm interviewing and hiring that I was so excited when I left school to apply every model I had learned. This was going to be so much fun. And then I didn't do that. Um, you do, right? But not right away and not most of the time because the thing that's most important is keep it simple. And I learned that diagnostic and descriptive analytics was actually how we need to start. And especially with organizations when they're in infancy with respects to utilizing data. And back then Kroger absolutely was there. Uh, so then I spent a lot of time uh, on the keyboard. I was the, I know it's super hard to believe, but I was that nerd who got super, got excited when I got a program to run and I got output and I knew how to analyze it. Like, you know, you have an error in your code and why is this happening? So I'd cheer when things would run in process. And one day I was asked if I'd like to take my hands off the keyboard. And that was like the, I just couldn't even believe someone would ask that question. Why would I ever want to take my hands off of the keyboard? So I said, no, probably not fully. And I was kind of half people leader, people manager, and then half still doer of the work and scoper of all of the work. And then lo and behold, time went on and I found myself as the head of data science for 8451. Now, clearly that didn't happen overnight. I purposely made strategic decisions within my career to get to that point. Um, but I had a lot of fun with it. It was all about uh, a lot of team development, talent development, retention strategies, also setting the strategic vision. But the one thing that I would say that I was the most passionate about at 8451 was remembering that our team was made up of people. And people leadership community building was what kept people there. That's when we didn't lose as many analysts. We didn't have a a matrician problem 
when we met people where they were at and when we listened to them. Uh, so that's what I spent a majority of my time doing. I was the one who put together all of the team activities. Um, and what I'd find was in meetings and when we'd have big broad share out. So when 8451 was going through the transformation from SaaS to cloud and to open source programming, I remember sitting in the room and we had all of these brilliant engineers up talking to the team and they had what looked like to me outer space on the screen in a whole bunch of languages that didn't make any sense. And there was like little dots moving around on the screen. And I started to look around me at everybody who also was brilliant data scientists. And I saw fear and I saw worry and I saw concern. So I just hopped up um, and I started talking to the team and I started talking to them about, you know, this is end state. And yes, I have no idea what's up on this screen either. We're going to figure that out together. We're going to take this slow. We're going to take that step back. And what happened after that meeting was people came up to me and they said, thank you for figuring out what was going. Thank you for seeing us. Thank you for reading us. And it was in the, those moments and not just that one, many others while I was there that I realized the thing that these brilliant people needed was a data science people leader. They needed that person who would be their voice, who could tell the business what they needed, who could um, just provide them with the support uh, that they needed and they wanted when they needed it and when they wanted it. When I actually made the decision to leave 8451, I had some of the uh, data science experts in the business come up to me very concerned that I was leaving. And I said, I don't know why you all are so worried about me leaving. I can't teach you anything. You know the world of data science. And what they said to me, it wasn't the fact, it's not what you can teach us, Sandy. It's what you can do and how you can lead us. And that's the thing that's missing. That's the thing that um, not many and not everybody brings to the table. Um, so, so anyway, I, I realize I, I've kind of gone off on a, maybe not a tangent. This is what I'm passionate about. No, oh, I, I enjoy sure. that. <laughs> okay, good, fun. <laughs> yeah. um, and so anyway, so then I went to Miami University and I was leading their Center for Analytics and Data Science for two years. I enjoyed it. I took that time away. Full transparency, I had had my fourth baby and I realized I don't have the time with her that I like. And so I had this great opportunity to build up this center, which was very much focused on uh, driving data and quantitative literacy to across different groups of thinkers. So every field, every industry of study needs to know data and understand data and how do I make decisions off of it. So it brought me back to that. Plus it brought me back to talent development closer to this group of people, these young people who are going to be leaving university. So what I tried to think through was what were we teaching at 8451 to upskill people, to get them ready uh, to be analysts or data scientists with an organization? How do I bring that to a college campus prior to these students leaving? Um, and then I met this guy named Doug Jenkins at uh, Smucker, and he was asking me to help find some junior talent at the university, and I did. And he explained to me this team that he was building. Uh, it was a new concept. Well, analytics wasn't a new concept for Smuckers, but the idea of having people really focused on driving the usage of data and analytics across their sales organization, it just wasn't at the caliber they wanted it to be. And they were looking for the right skill set, the, the right um, thinkers to bring into the room and to bring to the table to help drive these initiatives forward. And I had told him about um, some work that I had done at 8451 and, and also around talent profiles that we had built, which I'm also super passionate about if anyone is interested in that. Uh, and they were, so this whole new, this concept of team building, um, I was always told at Miami that I should uh, come up with my own consulting company because that's what everyone does. And I said, I don't know what the heck I would even do. The one thing I thought maybe I would do is consult on creating and developing highly effective analytic teams. Holy moly, here's what they were delivering right to me at Smucker. Perfect opportunity. So I raised my hand and said, hi, I might be interested. And that's where I've been for the last three months. That's that awesome. might have been a lot. 
Um, I'm not sure, but uh, more questions. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel like there's so many great parts in that. In that, and I I love the human centric ap- approach that a lot of these talks seem to to focus around, and just like that fact about like your role being about the people and being able to help them communicate their work. How would you recommend that some of us start to do that? Like as we think about moving into leadership roles. Um, I'm trying to think back to, um, the first thing I did. So I went to a, a leadership training, I guess you could call it. And if, if I'm being honest, I'm not sure that I, you usually take one or two good things out of some of those types of sessions, right? It's not like a whole full day of course, you're going to get everything is, uh, is as impactful as you'd like it to be. But the, this was, I think, the turning point for me when I was as a people leader was they asked the question of, does your team know what uh, you expect of them? And everyone in the room said, yes, our team has objectives for the year. And this facilitator said, I'm not talking about their objectives on a day to day basis. Do they know what you as their leader expect of them and what they need to do in order to be successful within your team, within your organization? That actually took me back. I was taken aback by that question because I thought to myself, I don't know how long I was into my career. And I realized I'm not sure anyone had ever had that conversation with me. I don't know that any manager I'd ever had, any leader had ever sat me down and said, here's what I expect of the people on my team. Here's what I want from you on a day-to-day basis. So I sat down and I put that list. I started to think through that. What what does that mean? So I, I was thinking about all of the different people that I admired, that I felt were like an inspiration to me and that I would look out for as those are the types of people in their careers that I want to be like at some point in time. And what was, what were the characteristics about them? Why did I think they were so successful? So I jotted down a list and then I started to build that whole list out. And I've been ever since then, even to this day. So at least 10 years now, I've been sharing this list with everyone that I work with. I shared in interviews um, and I actually wrote a blog post about it for Miami. So I'll potentially put that in the chat in case anyone's interested in seeing that. Yeah, that'd be Um, great. But those areas, it's kind of cheesy, I I know, uh, a bit, but the first thing I said was, I expect everyone on this team to be um, passionately curious. And the only reason I say that's not super cheesy to say is because Albert Einstein said it. And he's, you know, brilliant. So of course, that would be something. The reason it's cheesy is because at the time, Dunhumby's two, two of their values was curiosity and passion. And I thought, well, this is this is super cheesy that I've combined them, but what did I, I started, I start to tell stories about each of these areas and I bring it to life. And I remember there was a woman who used to work for me. It didn't mention, or it didn't matter to her what project I gave her. Everything excited her because she saw it as an opportunity to learn something, whether that meant she was learning about a new category, a new product. uh, She was learning about a new part of the business, or it was how to work with a difficult team, how to work with a difficult personality, somebody who was very different than me in their operating style. She just took it all head on. And so from a passion perspective, that's what I wanted to see. And then curiosity around, I just want to know more and I want to dig deeper, but also recognize when I've gone far enough, right? Because there's always scope creep that you need to be um, watching out for. So that was the first thing um, that I would tell people. That's what I'm looking for. You're not going to love your job every day, right? And so as a leader, I would talk about those days with my team. um, And I would tell them about days that I wasn't as having the best day or this project wasn't the most exciting thing that I got to work on, but I was going to do it because it was right for the business. So I made sure that they saw that the both sides for me as well, the stuff I loved and the stuff I didn't care for as much because they needed to know that was okay to feel as well. Another thing I would say to the team is, um, I have really high expectations of people. I expect you to do a lot. Um, And you're probably not going to like me all of the time because I'm going to push you pretty darn hard. Uh, But I promise you, at the end of our relationship together, you will be in a far different place than you were when we started. Uh, because I'm going to get to know you. I'm going to understand your strengths. I want to know your boundaries. Where's your breaking point? 
not because I want to break you, because I want to get us to that point and then we'll back up. And then we're going to push against that breaking point a little bit later. And you'll see that you've grown and that you can take on more. And there's that more might be more projects or even just less projects, but more technical. But that's the boundaries we want to push against. But I said, I need you to be honest with me when we've gotten to a breaking point or when you can't take more. Uh, a one woman who worked for me, one day she just broke down. I said, what the heck is happening right now? And she said, I just, I can't get all of this work done. And I said, how long have you felt this way? I don't know, about three weeks. And I said, well, for three weeks, I've been asking you to keep doing more. And you kept saying, yes, let's stop. Let's look through your calendar. Let's start figuring out what we can be pushed back and what can we not, what can't we do? Or what should we say no to? Um, and then another aspect of honesty is, hey, when something breaks, when something's going wrong, I need to know about it. I will be your biggest advocate. I will take the fall. I will take the blame for everything, but I need to know you're fixing it and I need to know about it. I don't want to be surprised. I don't want to find out in a meeting that I'm in. Um, so like they, they also saw that I was there to have their back. And, I, and I've played that out several times in meetings. I'll be bad guy. You be good guy. Um, and so they could see that in action too, to know that I actually meant it. Another thing I would say is I expect you to be challenging one another. We can do that respectfully. So we should be respectful. I always hated that I had to say that. I mean, I never feel like I should have to tell someone that they have to respect everyone on the team, but you do. Uh, but from a challenging perspective, I'd say you should be questioning the data. If something doesn't look right, if it doesn't make sense to you, ask a question about it. Um, is there an do you think that there was a potential different way to solve the problem? Mention it, bring it up. Someone doesn't have to take your advice or take your suggestion, but it's it's good for us to be thinking differently and challenging the thinking of one another. So I said, it's our job to always be challenging ourselves, challenging one another. And I even said, please challenge me. I'm not right all the time, even though I jokingly tell you that I am. I know that I'm going to make mistakes. I make mistakes every single day um, and I'll assess up to it. I'll tell you when I've made a mistake, but I want to know, like, I need you guys to like, we need to be pushing and challenging one another. Yeah. That's what we're here for. How do you actually like get people to do that? I find that difficult myself to do. Like, how do we teach people how to have those conversations, especially if we're all working remotely as well? So what I found is I have to meet people where they're at. In this new role that I'm in, I don't want to, I'm in, an, in a unique, interesting position where I'm finding, um, I'm asking questions that have never been asked before. And so for, for what I'm, I'm being asked to deliver things that I don't think I should be delivering. They're too rudimentary. We need to be elevating. We need to be escalating the work that we're delivering. So what I'm doing is meeting people where they're at. I'm gonna deliver part of what you've asked me for. And then I'm going to say, here's what I think you really need. And I'm going to add to it, right? And so I've, start, I've started out with the team of saying, let's deliver what's asked and more. There are times where I say, oh, no, we're not going to deliver that. That's not the right way to solve this problem at all. Let's sit down and have that conversation. Um, yes, exactly. It's the yes and, right? Um, that's the type of conversations that we're having. What you find and what you run into is... Um, there's the ego, um, it's not even ego, it's more of the, um, I, I'm so, this is my work, and are you trying to tell me my work is bad if you're challenging it? And so I'm trying to coach my team to, to suggest as well that always start with, these are some really good insights. Have we ever thought about looking at the data or digging into this a little bit further? I remember there was a woman on my team and I tried to, she was developing herself in her career. She was moving into more of a senior analyst type of position. And I would, she'd ask me to come sit in and observe meetings, but not necessarily to play an active role. And I, so I was listening. She was offering up suggestions on how to solve the problem. And I thought, that's not, I don't know that's the 100% accurate way to do it. So I followed up in the conversation with, I think that's a really great place to start in solving this problem. I'd add on to this plan by adding these questions, this approach. Um, so it wasn't a, oh God, no, that's the most, <laughs> that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, I'm, I'm more talking about let's, you know, yes, I really think that's a great approach. 
um, or and let's build from here. Yeah. Thank you. I'm starting to see a few questions that are coming sure. in that window. So I want to make sure I ask some of those too. Ian, I see you, you um, asked a question around the talent profiles. Do you want to ask that live or introduce yourself? Sure, I don't mind. Um, hey, Sandy, my name is Ian Hunter. I'm data science manager for Quorum Health um, in Nashville. And you yeah. mentioned and got really excited about talent profiles. <laughs> um, and so I was wondering if you could elaborate on um, what are these talent profiles that you're excited about? Are they based on data science skill level for hiring or upskill profiling? Just kind of elaborate on that for me. So I'm going to tell you one thing too, Ian, what people say about me is, wow, you get very excited about this stuff. So um, that's one thing that I'm not lacking of is excitement and passion around anything in this space. Um, so here, let me explain a little bit about where the talent profiles came from and why we um, took the time to develop them. As you're probably aware of being in analytics roles and analytics leadership or data science, uh, we, we were getting a lot of questions from the team around. So I have my expectations that actually weren't, weren't technically related at all, but the team would say, I don't understand what I need to do to advance in the, in the team, how do I get promoted? It always comes back to how do I get promoted? Um, what skill sets do I need to develop? And so what we did as a group, the whole leadership team, I brought us all together and I said, we need to start writing down what are all of the skills that our teams require? Like what are the needs, right? What is it that we expect of everybody? So we actually, we, I think we had a list of probably 50 or 60 things. Now, what does that look like? Uh, communication skills, business acumen. So some of the business, the more general stuff that you need to know just by being in the workforce, right? Then we had uh, things around storytelling. So data storytelling, data visualization, more technical skill sets around coding in R or Python. SAS as well was on our list. There's nothing wrong with SAS, I'm a SAS gal. Um, and there was more engineering type of a skill set as well around the automation. So we had blown out this list of about 50 or 60 skills. I think we dwindled that list down once we started to look, notice some overlaps. Then what we did was we defined what each of those skills meant and gave a description of what it meant to be a beginner, intermediate, and experienced within that skill. For each one of our grade levels within the organization from entry level all the way up to a senior manager on the team, how advanced did we expect you to be? Were you a beginner, intermediate, or advanced, or ex an expert? And you would notice that some of those skills would change, right? So like as a beginner on the team, or sorry, as a more junior entry level on the team, I probably do need to have more of the technical skill set, be a more avid, efficient coder. But as you evolve up into more senior people leader type of a positions, like I, I lot, that skill set could you know, diminish a little bit for me. Not everyone, that was just how my role actually played out. Then what we did was got real nerdy and we clustered all of those uh, skills. And we found that there were four main buckets or segments that actually started to emerge. And we used those to profile our team. And we came up with what we were called our uh, data science DNA is what we called it. So everyone on the team would rate themselves against each of the skills and you would start to see you could see how where you were, right? From I think we did like a one to five scale or something like that. And then you would find out, well, what type of analyst am I? So we had the just general bucket of skills, but then the three segments that really started to um, define our group, we have what was called an insights bucket. And this would be the analytic translator, that person who understands the technical aspects of the role, but is that great communicator out to the business. So I understand the business problem. I know the right approach to solving it. I'm not necessarily the one who's actively doing it. Perhaps products or capabilities have been built. I run my analysis, pull the insights in the story together with the recommendations, and I deliver that back out to the business. We also then had a more of the machine learning statistical theorist, as we, were, what we would call them. They were the people in the background thinking about the automated machine learning. So they're building the products and capabilities, implementing more of the sophisticated analytics, predictive, prescriptive, when you think about that analytics curve, 
that those of us who are more insights analysts could utilize in our day-to-day -day work and deliver that out to the business. Now, I'm in no way shape or my, I'm not at all saying that those people who were the machine learning or the statistical theorists weren't actively engaging with a client. They were, uh, but their skill set was utilized a bit differently um, and we would collaborate on projects. And then our third bucket was our uh, technologists is what we called it, but that role it felt very engineering, but they were the ones who would think about our products and our capabilities and how do we make them so, how do we automate those so that we basically take that, you know, that uh, repetitiveness out of our positions and actually just feed it into a system that can run for us very quickly and spit out those insights. Um, I started to do research after we had developed these as well and found that other organizations were thinking about their people in a similar way. They had different buckets, but it really made us feel like, oh, wow, look at this. We are onto something here. And our people loved it too, because they could see where did they fall out with their skills. And if they were like me, an insights analyst, but wanted to push the boundaries into the statistical theorist, they now knew the very specific skill set that they should go in and focus on learning and, and could find that mentor. That was another really cool thing we did out of this tool is when you rated yourself, if you could say, it, like, I want to be, I want to get more experience with, or I want to develop in automated machine learning, the system would send out to you, okay, well, here are some people who along with their manager, rate them as some experts within the team. These might be good mentors for you to reach out to. So that was a fun thing that we did as well, um, utilizing That's R. Awesome. Well, can you chat a bit or just speak a bit more about that tool? That sounds good. Um, so sure, but I didn't build it and I was more of a user of it, uh, but they really just built an R Shiny app that we could use. So all of the data was okay. implemented. So you, I think for the, I th think, don't quote me on this, originally we started it in Excel, so everyone would rate themselves, send it off to the person who would upload it, it upload the data into R Shiny, and then, or R, they would run it through the R Shiny app, and then it would spit out um, the information. But I think by the time I left, they had made it a bit more sophisticated, where it all just happened within that app, versus having to do it in Excel, send it off, somebody load it. Wow, that's cool. Um, is that so? Are you starting to maybe take some of what you did at a prior role and apply it to this new role? How are you building the community now and like mentorship programs? That's exactly what I'm hoping <laughs> to do. Uh, but I've only been here for three months, so again, I'm trying to meet people where they're at, and I'm not trying to overwhelm anyone with I with my ideas. I recognize that I am the new gal on the team. And I want to make sure that I am providing what the team needs. So that's the first thing I'm doing is actually listening to the new analysts that we're hiring. There are so we've just hired in the last three months, 25 people. That's overwhelming. And I am one of those 25. So I'm onboarding people who are new as I'm onboarding. So it's a it's a tricky situation. But the first thing I noticed was that we weren't coming together as a group. And Yes, we're virtual, and I understand that. So it's very hard to come together as a group. But this is coming together as a group. So I created what we're calling analytics learning labs. I know like we're all, 25 of us are learning something new right now. We're all upskilling in this business. There are some people within the team, like 15-ish, that were already here. Um, but, but what I've heard from them too is, there are still parts of the business I don't know enough about. So I've created these analytic learning labs and we come together on a weekly basis to learn something new about them. So part of the onboarding plan, but also an introduction to different parts of the business than perhaps we weren't necessarily in uh, or been exposed to in the past. My ideal, my idea though moving forward is once we get some of this learning stuff out of the way, learning about the business out of the way, we're gonna learn about the work everyone is doing. So it's showcases that the, the team can do, uh, talk about their work. Um, I need some peer review on this approach that I'm applying to this problem. Can you all help me figure out, is it the right model? Is it the right output? Is it the right interpretation? Is this a good story to be telling? So I wanna give that people the opportunity to um, 
get exposure that way because we're continuing to be in this remote world, it's very hard to then meet people across the team. So, um, but yes, I am. And then I also had some people on the team reach out to me and ask, we need, uh, this is something that's been missing with, from the organization is women in leadership. How do we, can we talk to some of these younger women within the organization and talk to them about how to become women, a female leader in analytics? How did you get there? How did you make some of the career choices you made, sacrifices that you had to make along the way, um, and, and kind of sort of mentor and build each other up that way? I love this community building piece. I'd say this is probably my favorite topic to talk about. And I, I know on a, a prior call, someone had brought up, um, like, how do we actually get people to want to share their work or if someone thinks maybe it's too like entry level of an example, how do you foster that community and the sharing? So I did this thing in 8451, which is gonna sound very similar to Analytics Learning Lab, but I called it peer review. Uh, I got asked there, uh, Sandy, I just don't know how to think on my feet in a meeting. How do you know when you're in a conversation and someone asks a question, how do you not stutter? How did you just talk and answer the question? Well, part of that is experience, right? You've just been around the block a time or two and you figure that out and fake it till you make it sometimes. And I hate that. I hate that saying, and I hate saying that, but sometimes that's a bit of where you have to be. But also practice. Let's get up and pressure test you in front of a crowd. So we actually made a rule that any project that was delivered had to go through peer review. Everything had to be shared with the project, with a group of analysts. And when you presented in this peer review session, you, you, you had to let the audience know what role you wanted them to play. Am I pretending as if I'm the client receiving this? So you're doing a very formal presentation to me. Or are you treating me as an analyst and you want me to help you better assess whether the technique, pressure test that. Pressure test how you've done that, the data you use, the model you've built, and then that output interpretation. Um, or is this more of a, I just want to do a project share out and make sure you're all aware of what I'm building because I think it's going to be beneficial to the rest of this team down the line. And so looking for feedback in that way too. Uh, so we kind of started to go down that path where a majority of the work actually did have to be presented in that way because it, <laughs> I don't like that word for us, but like it encouraged the practice uh, before, the, before the formal presentation. Yeah. Thank you. I see there's a few anonymous questions coming in from Slido. So just wanna let everyone else know if you're joining in a little bit later that you can ask anonymous questions there. Um, and someone asked, what makes someone a great analytics mentor? Uh, I, so what, uh, all right, I'm going to say this and I don't like to talk myself up ever, right? Because I think that I actually have a lot to learn and I don't know. I, so when Rob and Rachel reached out to me to do this, I was like, do you really think I'm the right person to do this? I'm just not sure about that. And they can attest that I actually said that. Okay. But what I found is I've only been at Smucker for three months and I have had three separate people reach out to me and say, hey, could we chat? I'd like to learn more. I'd like to pick your brain about how to do this, how to be in this field, how to continue to grow myself and how to stretch myself. And so um, a lot of what I do, again, it's just, honestly, I don't push my way into a conversation. I just look for somebody, what do you need from me? I'm happy to help you in any way. Some people, I said, if you just need someone to talk to, if you need someone to vent to about a situation, I'm happy to be that person. But you need to also let me know, do you need my advice? Do you need some, do you need some thoughts on how you might approach this? Um, so I try not to overstep bounds in that way. Um, and what I also have been, I try to share with people too, is a lot of times what's needed is they want a coach, right? They want something to just, provide them with a few plays, a few drills, something to give them a kickstart. Um, here's how you might want to start this. Here's the right approach for taking this or huh, heck, yes, I decided that I needed to take a step back in my career because it wasn't working for my family. Are there parts of me in some days where I'm like, God, I hate that I felt like I had to do that because I couldn't get the space I needed at my job. Yeah, but um, 
but it worked for me in the end, right? So like, I'm, I'm willing to give people, I, like I just, I share my stories. I share the successes, the failures I had. I noticed that there are a lot of, um, of men on this call as well. And I'm not saying this to diss any of you because I think you're all very delightful and I love working with men, but I've been the only, since I started my career, a lot of times I was the only woman in the room. And I said, take up your space. It took me so long to learn that, but like I'm, I've tried to build in this confidence with people. Now also I'm making it sound like I can only, or it's like this only females need the support. Um, I am an honest, transparent person. So I've had many, many men on my team as well, look for to me for mentorship and support and guidance. Um, and frankly, I've just told them how it is. Uh, they've asked me, why don't people want to work with me? And uh, like, well, you come across as the know-it-all in the room. So perhaps we need to change that attitude. So like, I think that's helpful in a mentor as well. Somebody who's willing to tell you what maybe you don't want to hear sometimes. I'm sure that's also helpful in communicating with the business too, yes. like the way that you're maybe phrasing certain things. And yes. um, I didn't want to jump to a different topic too, too soon, but was curious, like what other recommendations would you have taking what you just said there about communicating with the business as well? Um, so I just sent a note out yesterday to somebody within the business and I was giving them my recommendation for how we should approach a meeting that's coming up. And I said, I would not go into this customer meeting and talk about us as a company. Don't go into that meeting talking about them and what they need to be successful, what, where their current wins are, their successes, where are they lagging? And then ideas that we have around how they could potentially win in those lagging areas, but don't focus it on us and our brands. And that's controversial, right? Because most CPG companies, we wanna go in and talk about, well, here's how we can help or here's what we can do. And I said, I think we'll get invited to a second conversation if we focus on them. And I had two, two camps, right? There was one camp of, well, no, we need to make sure that they know that here, here, are our, here are the things we're bringing to the table. And then I had the VPs in the room saying, no, that's, is what we need to be doing, right? We wanna be strategic partners and a strategic partner would talk about the customer. The strategic partner doesn't say, what about me? Here's what, I, here's what I'm looking for and here's what we need out of this partnership. So we'll get there eventually. Um, but I'm also like, as a new person too, it's easy. And even when I wasn't the newbie in the room, um, I would ask some of the more difficult questions around why are we looking at it this way? And could I potentially take a stab at looking at it a different way or potentially approaching the problem, um, shaping deliverables in a different way so that they tell a more cohesive story and that they live on their own. I like that, thank you. I see um, Christian that you had asked a question earlier that was kind of a bit about our studio product specifically. So I don't want to like use it as a way to endorse our studio, um, like pro products, but Christian, would you want to kind of speak to maybe what you're going through or questions that you have about um, leveraging tools to drive growth at the business? And I can read the question too, if you want. So Christian asks, are you using our studio team? And if so, could you give an example of a time that your team has been able to leverage those tools to drive growth? So Teams as in Microsoft Teams or? Uh, our, Christian's referencing our studio pro product specifically, oh. but I think it could be in general. So our perhaps that answers your question then, Christian, when I say Microsoft Teams. Uh, so in my past life at 8451, there was the migration to from SAS to open source, so R and Python. And I was a part of the, I had to get the organization to really truly invest in this space. They kept saying, why aren't we utilizing R more? You guys should be doing this more. Why is it taking us so long to move off of SaaS or to move off of these other products? 
And my, I finally went into the room and I just shared with them this Nirvana state. Like, here's an example, a gold star project. Do you guys all love how this went and how the output? And they're like, yes, absolutely. That's what we should be doing. And I said, great, we can do one of these at a time. And it takes about three months to do because we don't have the right infrastructure in place. And they're like, well, what do you mean? They said, you're not investing. You're not investing in servers. You're not investing in the training of the team to be able to use these products. Um, so there, we, we changed the, we were able to get the resources that we need. I know I'm not answering Christian's questions specifically, um, but what I've been, what I tried to tell the team too, as we were migrating was I'm not, I don't care so much about the tool that you use. I care that we're using the right solutions and the right pro we're solving the problem in the right way. So if R is the right solution, if Python is the right solution, if say us or Altrix or Tableau or whatever it might be, that's what we should be using if we have those at our disposal. Um, in my team today at Smucker, we're hiring people with, uh, what wide ranging skills. So there are some people on my team who've actually not coded before. They're very comfortable running syndicated data reports, panel reports, and then packaging those up to tell a really great story. Um, and then there are others on the team who frankly, I would say are more data science um, minded and skill set wise, who are very comfortable and familiar using R and other programming languages. And that's what they want to be utilizing in their day job. Uh, so I'm not sure that I have a hundred percent answer to that question other than we're trying to use the best resource to solve the business problems. I, I like that. And I remember that from when we first talked with, uh, me and Rob, just chatting about the data science hangout and mentioning how you don't care what tool people use as long as they're getting the job done and they're using what is best for them. Yes. Yes. Kevin, I, I see you asked a question uh, around leadership and was wondering if you want to introduce yourself and ask that live. Yeah, I would love to. Um, so I'm Kevin, um, working at Grail as a statistical analyst. Um, so having a great time there. Hi, Kevin. Um, hello. Um, I was wondering, you've had so many, like a, a very long path and a very like awesome like leadership path um at so many different roles i was wondering which role you found most rewarding um so this oh god i'm such a dork um i kind of get chills whenever i think about this which again is ridiculous uh people used to ask me all the time what was your what's your proudest moment when i was at 8451 and actually what i would tell them was when i was working with somebody who was struggling and i'd and i'd see them succeed I spent time in them. I invested in them. I helped them develop their skill set. I got them to the point where people started to say, oh, look at what they can contribute. Because I saw potential in people that oftentimes others maybe either were too busy to see or weren't willing to see. So that's actually been my most rewarding is just working with people and seeing them continue to grow in their usage of data and analytics. And um their ability to influence the organization because of those skill sets that I've helped them to develop and think differently and ask challenging questions. But um, those were some of my proudest and the things that I had the most fun with and enjoyed the most. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And then in kind of building on that too, from a leadership perspective, um, I feel like a lot of my time and how I got to those roles was basically self-taught. I mean, you learn from some of your good managers and you also learn from those who weren't so great in developing you over time. Um, and I remember there were all these, there were many different opportunities for training or even leadership programs that the organization was sending people to. And I, and I kind of got mad once because I asked about them and I was told, oh, well, you're already figuring this stuff out. You're already doing it. We don't necessarily think you need it. And I said, you can't stop investing in me. I need it too. So I also would speak up for myself. So I think those were opportunities too, where just because I could figure it out on my own doesn't mean I should have had to. Do you think then, sorry, as a follow-up question, do you think then is it more important to be, I guess, pushed into um, 
like I guess leadership and like more teaching yourself how to do these things or do you think it's more or should should industries be teaching you how to be passionate if that's even possible great interesting question because I learned some lessons the hard way. It took me a long time to be comfortable with who I was, what I was good at, um, and just to have the confidence that I felt I needed. I used to like, like, like I would minimize my space in a room sometimes because I was just like, I'm not sure I have as much value to add in this conversation. I'd wait for others to speak up. And then I remember one um, training that I was in, I was probably the most quiet person in the room, which is surprises people now to hear this but I, I would answer I had answered a couple of questions and the facilitator was like you guys need to listen to her when she speaks she really doesn't which was like hello that sounds terrible like when she speaks listen to her but she knows what she's talking about like she's got really good ideas and that made me like it clicked for me in that moment like stop doing these things be a voice voice that opinion and in leadership roles I remember I, I do wish that I had been given opportunities, been a, assigned a mentor. I never was given, I had to find people myself, which actually I prefer to do. I, I prefer to find people who are in the same life stage or about to be, or you know, just past the life stage I'm in so that I can learn from them. But at the same time, I wasn't given those opportunities to truly um, be coached on how to lead and be coached on how to, have effective conversations with leadership. I sort of had to fumble through it. I did just fine, clearly. I got into a really great position at 8451, but there were times, and I, even when I left, I said, you didn't invest as much time in me as I think you should have. Yeah, I learned it a lot myself. Now, do I think people should be pushed into those types of positions? No. I say that with a question mark, uh, because I worked with some very technical um, data scientist at 8451 who had said to me, I don't want to be a people manager. If you need someone to tell, to be a technical mentor or a technical manager, I'm all in. But if it's going to come to me having to manage them, their performance management stuff, just the conversations throughout the year, that's not what I want to do. That's not where I'm passionate. And so I didn't want to ever force someone into a position like that. Some people figured out over time they enjoyed it. Um, but does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think so. Um, yeah, it is interesting that so, yeah, some people, some people are like very driven towards um, just being technical and just wanting to do, wanting to stay in the data analyst um, or staying behind the keyboard as you were saying before um rather than like dealing with people and doing all of that arduous um task if that's their um opinion about it yeah. Uh, but yeah i think it, yeah thank you for answering my question yeah. Yeah, and i see there's an anonymous question as well that is related to this topic um so do you think that it's possible to to really do both well like the hands-on development work and management. I know you mentioned at the beginning that at first you didn't want to be uh, a leader because you wouldn't get to actually do that, that hands-on coding. I think it depends on the size of a team. So when I was originally put in the position where I had, a, a, I was managing a team and scoping and doing work, I probably had two or three people reporting to me. When I was the head of data science, I had 15. Uh, there was absolutely no way that I was going to be able to do work, uh, do technical work, hands-on technical work while managing that level or that amount of people. Um, so, but I could have my hands in the different types of projects and offer up opinions on perhaps not the right approach or the specific model to apply or the analytical technique, but I could offer suggestions around, here are some other questions that you might want to uh, um, attempt to answer with that, or here's another angle, a different way of thinking about it or interpreting some of those results, right? So we could pressure test in that way too. Um, so I think it's possible up to a certain level. And then once you have hit a certain point, you just can't possibly manage it all. Or wait, maybe you can. I just didn't figure, I couldn't figure out a way to do that and have 
four kids. Yes, I have four kids. There's no way that I was going to be able to have the life I wanted there, plus the career that I was uh, aspiring to have. And, you know, so it was just, um, you have to make choices, in my opinion. And sometimes those choices aren't the ones that you, you might shift over time. So. Thank you. I, I think this is a really important uh, question as well that came in anonymously. As I've progressed in my career, I feel guided into people management roles. And they said, maybe because I am a woman, whereas I like and am good at technical work. Any advice for this? Ask for what you want ask for what you want. Um, that was the one thing when I think back to my younger self is I didn't speak up on my own behalf. I didn't fight for what I really wanted sometimes. And that was unfair. Um, once I finally felt comfortable with my own voice and my own skin, um, things started to happen. In fact, I, Okay, so I was asked to do to speak at another engagement. And I was telling my husband, like, you know, I don't know, someone so asked me, how did you get involved? Uh, how did you get asked to do that? They didn't ask it that way. Like, how did you get asked to do that? But I interpreted that way, right? And my husband finally said to me, we stop. We stop saying that. You've earned everything that you've, that you've gotten, right? Everywhere you've gotten to, you worked really hard to get there. You need to start remembering that. And you have to, you have to tell people you want what you want and ask for those sorts of things. And in some situations, they demand it. Um, I, I have worked with so many other people with those personalities, male and female, who never felt bad, right, about demanding things. And I was always the one in the room. He'd be like, I would really like the opportunity. If you think I should have it, if you don't think I should, that's okay thing too. So I'll just sit back here and be quiet again. I need to break that down. I need to stop doing that. So if you feel, whomever asked that question, if you feel like you're the person who's just like, okay, yes, I'll just do whatever you tell me to do, but I'd rather be doing this thing over here, ask for it. Show what you're capable of in that space. Thank you. There was a, a few questions earlier that I'm, I'm scrolling up trying to, to keep track here that I realized I missed. And one goes back to, few points ago when we were talking about managing the team and what do you do when someone is underperforming? How do you handle that? Well, I've had to deal with that a few different times in my career. Uh, and I want to tell you, and I'm, I don't know if you've experienced this as well, no matter the amount of times that you tell someone that they're not meeting expectations, when you finally sit down with them to have that conversation about a performance plan, they are blown away that you are having that conversation. Um, and no one really seems to, they say, no, 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 people should never be surprised. You're correct, they shouldn't be because you've had the conversation, but they always are, they always are surprised. Um, but again, I'm, I try to be very open, honest, transparent along the way. So as soon as I start to notice a behavior, I call it out. Hey, I've noticed that you're trending in this direction. Here are some things I think we need to do to stop that or to change some. So here's how you're not meeting expectations. Your deliverables are late. We're not meeting deadlines. What might be happening? Um, or also not just say like, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing saying, hey, I noticed we, we missed this deadline. Was there something going on that I didn't wasn't aware of? Because sometimes it might even just be that um, a coworker of mine, I didn't know that she was going through a really hard time in her marriage. And like, she told me that it's like, shoot, we could have helped, right, as a team. So there's often times where you can meet people, like figure things out, what's going on behind the scenes, but have the conversations repeatedly and also come up with a plan. Actually, I try to put it in their hands. Here are the areas that you're not meeting expectations. What do you think you should do to meet, meet to like improve in those areas? And then let's get back together and talk about those. What might be missing from that plan? And then we'll still, um, and then we'll kind of align on it and meet regularly about it. So even when people might be having a hard time in their personal life, that doesn't mean we can allow them to continue to not meet expectations. It just gives you a frame of reference for where they might be at and how can I potentially approach them in a different way. So hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it, it seems like regardless of if we're talking about like 
data science leadership questions or, or like sharing things out to the business, so much of it comes back to communication. And I know um, Rick, who's on the call, and I were kind of chatting on LinkedIn earlier this week around like the skills that you use to succeed in data science and what you're taught is not normally the communication type of skills. And Rick, I'm curious if you want to weigh in on, on that and what we were chatting about. Yeah, sure. I, I think I also put a, a message in the chat here. I, I mean, the more I think about what we're taught about communication skills, is they're very poorly defined because communication skills encompasses mass amounts of spectrum of things that, that we need to do. And also communication itself is very poorly defined. And, and I feel that technical people see the world and understand their work in a certain way. And that helps them to excel in math and sciences and, and all the things that we love and do. And then the people skills part and the communications part is part of that requires a completely different way to understand how pieces fit together and how these things work. And one, one thing I've kind of convinced myself about in trying to understand how to teach communications and these kind of so-called soft skills to technical people is that they need to reframe the way that they approach these kind of skills and that it's not this hard versus soft kind of thing, which already kind of separates them out, right? Like I'm very good at the technical hard skills, but these soft fuzzy skills I have no idea about, so I can't, I can't bother with it, which already kind of put them on another level, but to kind of reframe the way that they approach these things and see how they can understand those skills and their skills and on one spectrum and that they're kind of operating not as kind of changing their, their mind and saying, well, I just have a mind for soft skills or those are people, people, and I can't do that. I do the power technical stuff, but to kind of reframe all of those skills as kind of a spectrum and say, well, my technical stuff are on this side and my, my people stuff are on this side, but it's all kind of one wide spectrum. And I'm moving and operating on this on the spectrum instead of saying it's a, it's a dichotomy, it's a binary thing where I need to make this huge leap in a binary, which is boring and, and hard, but it's a, it's a continuous spectrum. It's a three-dimensional, multi-dimensional range mm -hmm. of skills that we move around in. And that's a, that's a way that I kind of try and approach how I think about communication and people skills when I talk to technical people. You know, it's real interesting to hear you talk about this because I can't remember who it was within this last probably six months. I was talking to them and they said, I get so tired of people saying soft skills. Communicating about data is not a soft skill. That's not easy. Um, storytelling, that's not a soft skill. Sure, it's not a technical in the sense of like I'm writing code or engineering or in that realm of technical, but it's still on the spectrum, right? And we have to think. So I would, I created a um, art and science of storytelling training at Miami for the students to go through so that they could flex that muscle mm. because that was absolutely something they needed to be able to do. It wasn't just because I was seeing some of the stuff they were delivering. I'm like, you have really great insights. The way you're delivering it isn't so great. Let's talk about that. Let's develop yeah. that skill. Yeah. 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 I would, I'm not sure if that's something that's publicly available, but I would love to see that if that's something that is available somewhere. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, I probably, so I also picked up a class at Miami and I used, I taught the, the same sort of content in my first lecture. So I'll have to go out and see if I can find it. A lot of that stuff is probably still on my Miami computer. I didn't take it with me, but yeah. yeah. But the concepts I still have, Rachel, so I can share those. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, I see um, people are all commenting plus one and sure I need to take a <laughs> class like that too. Yeah. Um, as we get to the top of the hour here, I know some people may have to drop off and Sandy, if you have to drop, let me know as well. Um, but just want to see if people have follow-up questions for you, what's the best way to get in touch? Well, you can get in touch with me over LinkedIn if you'd like, or you could, well, you know, I can, do you want me to drop my email address in the chat in case anybody wants to chat with me there? Or would you prefer to just say LinkedIn? Whatever is better for you. If LinkedIn's there, we could put your LinkedIn uh, uh, URL there. Yeah, I will put my email address too, just in case anybody has any other questions. Um, and awesome. Then, yep. Thank you. And if it's okay to ask a few more remaining questions. Sure. Mm -hmm. I have a few more minutes. Yep. Okay, cool. Thank you. 
There was one other anonymous question on how do you foster an environment where teammates challenge each other? I make sure that everyone remembers that we are not here to poke. We are here to make everyone better. We are here to learn from one another. Um, and I oftentimes will allow myself to be the first victim of it. Like, here's what I've put together. Let's tell me what's wrong with it. Tell me what I could do better. Let's challenge. But, but a lot of it too is just around, remember there's positive intent. We aren't actually here because we want someone else's job. We all really genuinely want our team to be successful. We want each other to be successful. We want the business to be successful. And that's why we're challenging. Yeah. So I try to remember, and if I ever feel like um, tensions are rising or tones start to get different, I oftentimes jump in and I am a, I'm a very sarcastic person and I like, I use humor a lot. And so to like break up that tension. And so I'll jump in with whatever it might be, whatever I feel like is needed in order to break that back down and bring everyone back to remember that we are one, drink, one team. We're all here to succeed. Definitely. And, and Rob and Robert, as you're also helping monitor the questions, please let me know if I missed anything. I was uh, scrolling through some of the, the discussion in the chat as well. And I see some really great points from Tori as well around communication and like that reminder of like putting things into terms that people in the business can understand as well and trying not like some understanding that sometimes it can intimidate people some of the work that data scientists do that's something that i've i've been thinking about a lot lately and this isn't just about smucker this is actually about many organizations that i was exposed to while i was at miami and then even 8451 and kroger who have been working in this space for such a very long time um i said that data and numbers are hard for a lot of people they don't get it when you show them a number oftentimes they feel paralyzed and so it is our job to make sure that they understand that like we show them in a very clean easy to understand visual or and through a nice headline or a nice one pager we just spell it all out simply we tell them exactly what they needed to know based on the data um, and try to actually show don't put a data table. I can't stand that. I don't, sometimes I guess it's very helpful, but like most of the time, let's not use data tables um, because a lot, like sometimes people just don't even know where to look. Like, how do I look at this? What am I supposed to do with it? Too many numbers. I don't know which one is the most important. Like it's, it's in math is, and it's not, it's just numbers are so intimidating for some people. As one final question, I'd love to ask you as we've, kind of been bringing this up on a bunch of the different sessions as well. Are there any podcasts or resources that you'd recommend or things that you listen to or read? Um, I, a lot of what I'll say from a reading perspective, it comes down to, um, there, so, well, it was a former colleague of mine, but becoming a data head is a, this is a really good i have it right next to me and actually i posted about it with my daughter she's only three so she didn't really read it but i pretend i saw that on your yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this book i don't like reading books like this and i told my coworker, i don't write like reading books like this because when i'm not at work i don't want to be reading about work but i told him and i i always feel like they're over my head and i'm a smart enough person so like i just it just i don't it doesn't click for me anymore because i'm not in, i feel like because i'm not in school this was so easy to understand and I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it. And so I was like, well done, Alex. You and Jordan did a really nice job on this book here. I even wrote a little something in here for them to like, that was me. Awesome. Me, so. <laughs> but like, this, I need a book like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now from like a podcast, Oh, because I'm, I have imposter syndrome pretty badly. There's a good podcast there. I'm going to have to go back and find it because it's been a while since I listened to them, but it's really just about remembering like what you bring to the table. So anything like that. And I'm just more of a, 
I need inspiration. And those, that inspiration, oftentimes I need it not in the form of inspire me to want to do more analytics, just inspire me, make, bring positivity to my life. So that's just some of the other things that I like to read. Um, there's also another book that has the F word in the title, um, you know, that subtle art of not giving an F. Um, that's a good one too, because I often care too much. So I like that. I'm not one. sure if I should say that because it's being recorded. So I just, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Sandy. I'll do one last check to see if anyone on has any other questions that I've missed. And it gives a few more oh, seconds. I, um, Sandy, just from listening to you, it sounds like you're very passionate about team building. If, there, if you haven't read Nine Lies About Work, it sounds terrible, but it is, it is great. It basically talks about what makes a team function well. And it's really about, you know, you're surrounded by people with similar um, priorities. They've got your back. Like it's, I yep. think it would ring true to you. Um, cool. Yeah. I love this stuff. Adam Grant has a podcast that people also are interested in um, podcasts. He, he is a social scientist. I got that right. Um, basically, he studies how to make work not suck, and the people that he interviews on the podcast are, are fun. So, well, check that one. out. I just told my boss today, because or yesterday, I said, people need something to believe in. They need someone to believe in, and that's what they're looking for in, like, their job, right? And it's not even, like, I'm, I always worry that, like, people are going to leave, and it happens, right? But, like, for the most part, I just want people to realize, like, enjoy know that they have a manager or a leader that supports them that believes in them that listens listens to them um and so yeah i'll definitely i took the note i'll check those two things out but um sounds right up my alley tori what was the name of the first book sorry i got to find that it's called nine lies about work here i'll send a picture okay cool. <laughs> thank you it sounds terrible i i know but it really is great <laughs> Oh, I can't send a picture. I'll send the link to Amazon. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, no, and the follow-up on Tori's comment, I posted this in the uh, comments. There's a book called Quiet by Susan Cain, and it's all about introverted people, and, and there's a whole section on everything that's wrong about open, open format offices and all these studies that just show how collaboration doesn't have to happen with a group of people. In fact, collaboration can happen like this. Uh, and they, sh they show you that there's a lot of studies that say collaboration happen when, happens better when people work on their own, they bring it together, and then they go back and work on their own. It's, it's, a fa it's been a fascinating read so far. Thanks, Thanks, Brian. And a little preview, Brian Butler will be speaking with us all next week. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sandy. I really appreciate your time and, and being so open and honest and candid with us. Well, great. thank you for inviting me, Rachel. I, I hope something of value was brought to everyone on the call. So appreciate the time. Sure. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day, everyone.